Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I always like to start on time, and I'd like to thank you all very much for coming to the Canastota Public Library. My name is Liz Metzger, and I'm the library director. And the very first order of business is if you're carrying a cell phone with you tonight, please turn it off or silence it, because you won't want to miss a word of our wonderful program. <laughs> Without any further ado, please give a warm welcome to our presenter, presenter seven four years in Denver. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when I drove up just a little while ago, I saw the sign that Liz has out front, and it tells everybody right away that I'm 74 years old. <laughs> uh, and tonight we're going to celebrate and review uh, the, the railroading life of John Tavy. And I have to tell you that next month, he'll be 75 years old. <laughs> for 45 of those years, he lived on Long Island. And for the last 30, uh, he's lived in Munsville and retired in the uh, old New York, Ontario, and Western Railroad station. So I've almost been there for half of my life. Uh, but. From those 30 years that I've been up here, I have developed some degree of uh, knowledge and specialty in railroading, of which a lot of you have come uh, to enjoy. And when this whole project was envisioned, and Liz asked me if I would do a program for her series of programs, I said to her that I really would like to do too. This one and the one she mentioned about my latest book, Hojack. But for those of you that know me, you know that I'm a little bit of a bashful and shy person. <laughs> so I asked myself as the third person to do this. And I, I dislike saying I all the time. So I'm going to try to stay in the third person. And most of the time when people ask me, and it's a frequently asked question, uh, how did I come to, to like railroading? And I tell people that I was born to like railroading, just like people that was born to, uh, uh, to do anything, whether they like to fish, whether they like to hunt or whatever. Well, for me, it, it was railroading, and I've already Liz, I already blew this third person. <laughs> and I already, I'm already disappointed in myself too because I didn't want to talk uh, of myself. I wanted to have somebody else talk of me too. But despite the fact that uh, I always tell people I was born to like railroading, my earliest memories of that interest was in the third grade uh, when uh, I was uh, in this uh, village elementary school in Brentwood on Long Island in 1955. I can remember on the cover of all of my books, drawing locomotives and all that kind of thing, and I haven't got the book. Vegas idea now how it came to be that I had the desire to do that. All I know is that I didn't like it. Well, our teacher, Mrs. Burns, and by the way, that's John Tavy right there. <laughs> <laughs> I always like standing next to a tractor. Um, <laughs> she recognized that I liked railroad because this a uh, schoolroom was in a Presbyterian church. In 1955, Grantwood was still growing from the, all the housing developments and, and schools hadn't been built yet. Well, these windows here looked out onto the railroad tracks at the Grantwood Railroad Station. And whenever a train came into the station, of 
course, they blow the horn because there was a crossing right there, and the gates would go down. And as soon as I heard the, the train blowing for the crossing, I'd be looking out the windows. So you can see that she moved this filing cabinet to <laughs> <laughs> my view. <laughs> and what happened was, as a retired teacher, you know how distracting this is when a, a kid uh, is always waiting to see the next train. Uh, she started to pull the shades down. As soon as she heard the train coming, she pulled the shade down, and that was it. And of course, all the other kids in class would start giggling uh, and everything else. Um, but I also vividly remember from, from these days that I was hoping to see a steam locomotive. And I didn't, at the time, I didn't even know what a steam locomotive was. And I didn't know then that the Long Island Railroad stopped using steam engines the month before I went to school. But every time a train came in, I'd look to see if it had a steam locomotive on it, and it didn't. So that was my earliest remembrance of uh, railroading and having an interest in it. Four years later, I was in the sixth grade, and this girl was my classmate, and this picture was taken in a park on Long Island where we had our sixth grade graduation uh, picnic. And you can see she has her arm lovingly entangled around my arm and all. And at the time, all I did was play baseball and watch trains. And she, whatever her intentions were, she definitely has me roped right in there. But, uh, and, and before I read this picture, keep her in mind, because I'm going to talk about her again in a little while. But also in 1959 was when I took my first train picture. This is a picture of a Long Island Railroad train coming into, uh, into Brentwood. The crossing was right here in the church that we had gone to school in, was just uh, beyond the crossing. So this is the first picture that I've ever taken of a train. And how it came to be that I still have that picture, I don't know. Because I've taken so many other early pictures from that era that I don't have. I, but somehow the first one was a survivor. I don't know, I don't know how that came to be. But in total, it was the first of, I think, close to 35,000 railroad pictures that I've taken. And you're not going to see all of them tonight, of course. <laughs> you're going to get a, a, a little a taste of, of, of what I did. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1965, but for the last few summers before I graduated, I used to work in a machine shop in Cuddybackville, New York, which is a little town in uh, Orange County. And this fellow right here, his name is Vinnie Visage. That's his wife, Margie, and of course, that, that's me. God bless those days of thin bodies and God <laughs> almighty. But, uh, he was the best man for my father and mother when they got married. So I used to go up to work in his machine shop every summer, and I enjoyed it. My brother tried working there one summer, and he says, he's not going back, it's just a sweatshop. <laughs> but I liked it, because Vinny was very mechanically minded. He was interested in all different facets of of mechanical things. And where the house was, it's situated right on Oakland Valley Road, it looks out over the Never Sink Valley. And on the hill on the other side of the valley, I noticed there was a scar of land going across the hill. And one day I said to Vinny, I says, what's, what's that scar over there? And he said very reverently, he says, oh, that was the O&W, because this was 1962, the O&W had been abandoned for five years. So it was through Vinnie that I learned of 
the New York, Ontario, and Western Railway. And of course, that's the railroad for the station that I live in now. So it was because of, of this connection. And isn't it a funny thing that here's a fella uh, and his wife from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he was the best man for my father. And I went to work with him. And that's how I found out about the OMW. So little by little, I was developing somewhat of, a, of an interest in railroads. And by the way, I have to tell you too, that this building here, the house, in the three, three and a half summers that I worked there, I painted that whole house twice. <laughs> so maybe my brother was right. It could have been a sweatshop. But I, I, I did enjoy it. <clears throat> After I graduated from high school, uh, I was drafted by the, uh, the Army in 1966. And rather than go into the Army, I decided to uh, enlist in the Air Force. If I went in the Army, I was, would have been in for two years, the Air Force four years. But I figured, well, if I go in the Air Force, my chances of going to Vietnam were more remote. So I enlisted in the Air Force, and the next year I was in Vietnam. <laughs> and, and that's uh, one of the stories of my life. I, I am proud to be a Vietnam vet. Uh, and I have to tell you all, regardless of what you've heard from probably many other fellows that were over there, it was one of the best times of my life. It was a job in the Air Force. Excuse me? What was your job in the Air Force? I didn't catch what it. What was your job in the Air Force? Uh, we flew into all small places to deliver cargo. Uh, but it was something that I enjoyed doing. I liked being with all the other fellows. We hung out together. None of us smoked or, or, uh, or used drugs or anything, although we did drink pretty heavily. <laughs> Uh, nevertheless, this is a picture of, of me, and in the background is Tent City, and that's, that's where we lived in Danang. And when I was there, uh, after 11 months or so, everybody kept asking me, was I going to go on R&R? &R? Because anybody that went over there, you were entitled to, uh, to one rest and recuperation uh, leave. And I thought, well, I don't know, I was having such a good time being where I was, doing what I was doing that, you know, after 11 months, why? But then I met a, a staff sergeant by the name of Jerry Lewis. And it's not the Jerry Lewis <laughs> you know, uh, But I flew with him quite frequently, and he said, well, he was going to go to Hong Kong on R&R. &R. So I said, well, all right, I'll go with you. So we went together to, to Hong Kong, and I was surprised that when we left Da Nang by air, it was only 45 minutes to Hong Kong in the air. And my thought was, holy crap, here we are in a, in a backwoods yeah. country <laughs> in war and everything else. And 45 minutes away was such a nice place, and Hong Kong really was quite a nice place. And one of the things we did uh, together when we uh, were there is we rode on the train and we left, I guess it must have been, it wasn't Hong Kong because that's the island, so it must have been Kowloon, and then we rode the train as far as we could go without going into uh, the, uh, the communist part of the country. And that's where this is. If anybody can pronounce that, you're better than I am. But Jerry Lewis took that picture of me there. And this picture was the first color railroad picture that I took. And that's our train coming into that station. And you can see I've got uh, a 35 millimeter camera hanging around my neck. That was an Asai Pentex camera that I bought in Hong Kong. Uh, and it was, at the time, the uh, the better camera than what I had been using to take pictures because that first picture that I show you that I took was taken with my father's August C3 and then I had another small 35 millimeter fixed lens camera to use so that 
uh, a side Pentex single lens reflex was really quite a step up. When I came home from Vietnam uh, in February of 1969, I made my first trip to Munsville. And you might be wondering, well, how did somebody from Long Island come home from Vietnam and go to Munsville? Well, what happened was, is when Vinny Visage introduced me to the O&W, I took an interest in that, and I started corresponding with a group of people, one of whom was the fellow that lived across from this railroad station in Munsville. So when I came home on my R&R, &R, I figured, well, we've been writing back and forth all the time, sharing pictures and, and stories and all. I said, I'm going to take a ride up to Munsell. So I did. Well, at the time, they had six little kids who were now all 40 and 50 years old. But they were little kids then, and the kids thought that I was coming all the way from Vietnam just to see them. <laughs> And they were, they were right, I did come from Vietnam. But this was my first view of the Munsville Station. This wasn't taken on my trip there in uh, February, but this is of the same era. And that's the, uh, the station that I live in now. But you'll see it a little different in a moment. And on this first trip, I learned about that station also being on the O&W, that was the same O&W in the Neversink Valley and Cuttingback Park. And this is a picture that was taken shortly before the railroad was abandoned. And this picture here shows the station with the scrapping train going by, taking up all the rails in 1958. So that was my first visit to Munsville. And then after my leave, my next duty station was down in Louisiana. And I was, when I got those orders to go to Louisiana, I was very disappointed about going down to, to, to the south. I don't know why. It didn't particularly, uh, wasn't something that I liked. But when I got down there and I started uh, learning the, the, about the country and meeting a lot of the people, I had uh, develop, I would develop quite a, a, uh, a pleasant opinion of, of Louisiana. And these were a couple of the first color pictures that, uh, that I took uh, after buying that 35 millimeter camera in, in Hong Kong. But along the way, at uh, being stationed in Louisiana, I met Harry Boudreau, and Glenn Anderson. Glenn was another uh, Air Force man like I was. He was also stationed at England Air Force Base. And Harry was uh, a native Louisianan. Uh, he was born in Plaquemine, Louisiana, but he lived at the time in, uh, in uh, Alexandria. And he was quite a character. Uh, he was at the time, I guess about 62 years old, and of course I was 22 years old, and how it came to be that those 40 years of age that separated us still made us so pleased to be with each other, I don't know, but we used to go out on picture taking, jaunts and everything else, and Harry would always bring uh, hard boiled eggs and apples uh, for a snack. <laughs> I, I was young, I guess my digestive system had such combinations then. But we'd, we'd sit and we'd talk and pass the time while we were waiting for a train. And, and one day, uh, for some reason or other, Harry took out his wallet and he went to get a picture of something out of his wallet. And I noticed he had a lot of money in his wallet, which was something that I never have a lot of in my wallet. And I said, gee, Harry, I said, well, what do you have all that money for? He says, I always carry a thousand dollars. He says, a thousand dollars, it reminded me of Brett Maverick having a thousand dollar bill stuck on the inside of his lapel. I says, what do you need a thousand dollars for? He says, let me tell you one thing, partner. You'll never know when you're going to have to leave town fast. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I thought to myself, there's got to be a good story there, but I never guessed. We became very good friends. Harry is, Harry's the man. When I go to wherever it is we go and we pass away, I'm sure Harry will be there. And next to my father and Vinnie Visage, I'll be happy to see him as well. Glenn Anderson worked in the photo department uh, on the base. And uh, you can see he's got a 35 millimeter camera hanging around his neck too. I believe that that was a Canon. And he taught me a lot about photography. He, he really was uh, quite a, a sharp kid. He lives in, in Texas now. And, he has some health issues and everything else, but whenever we talk on the phone, I always remind him, gee, Glenn, if it, if it wasn't for you, I'm not quite sure I would be where I am today. One of the things that Harry and I did frequently was we went to the Reader Railroad, which was uh, situated in Reader, Arkansas, and that's a picture of Harry taking the cab of locomotive 1702. And for some reason or other, the crew that ran this operation, it was only two guys. The engineer was Dale, the fireman was Junior. I wish I could remember their last names, but I don't. They worked in the shop, they ran the train, they did the track work. It was just the two guys. We got along quite well together. And I used to go up there uh, when I was off duty and, and help them work in the shop. And you'd be surprised uh, how much you can learn working with a few guys that are chewing and spitting tobacco all the time <laughs> around steam locomotives. But you can, and I did. And uh, Harry always liked going up there, and, and I still think very fondly of the times that he and I went together. <clears throat> this, was, this picture was taken uh, on my very first uh, trip on the Reader Railroad, and you might say, well, gee, look at all that smoke, it's all pollution, and blah, 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 but I got to remind you, back in 1969, nobody gave a hoot about it. <laughs> <laughs> the train is on its way to Waterloo, Arkansas, which was the end of the line, and they had a couple of passenger cars on the end. Well, on this particular day, I was... Uh, able to ride in the cab of a locomotive, as it says, my first cab ride. And how that came to be was that I, I learned through the grapevine that when you went to buy your ticket at the reader station to ride the train, I think it was something like $1.75 for a ticket or $2, whatever it was, if you paid an extra dollar, they let you ride the locomotive. Yeah. Hot damn! <laughs> I paid an extra dollar. I was a, a cheapskate then, just like I am today, but that extra dollar was good. Well, I bought that ticket the day before this uh, train ride. <clears throat> and that night I did not sleep a wink. I was thinking, oh boy, I'm going to be riding in a steam locomotive. The first steam locomotive I've ever seen. I thought about it in third grade. I hope I see a steam locomotive. Never did. All of a sudden, I see a steam locomotive. So I didn't sleep at all that, that night before. And also thinking that I was going to be riding in the camp. So on this day, this was the spot that they always stopped for photo runbys. They, they pulled the, the passenger cars up. If people wanted to get off to take a picture of the train, they dropped them off and back up, and then come by making all of that smoke. Yes. Uh -huh. So you can see it was a great spot for a picture, and I think it's, it's quite a good one. So when I got back in the locomotive, I said to Junior, the fireman, I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, so how did you make all that smoke come out just when we needed it to take the picture. Uh, so, he said, so he said, well, there was a, uh, a little pail sitting next to the, uh, the firebox door, and it had sand in it. He says, what we do is when uh, we're coming up to the photo line, and I think this day I was the only one in the photo line, 
He says he opens the fire door and holds a handful of sand in front of the door and the draft from the locomotive sucks the sand out of your hand and goes through the flues and what you're actually seeing is the soot that's built up in the flues, in the flue of the engine coming out. And of course, when they sand the flues, then the steam locomotive can run more efficiently. Of course, at the time, I didn't know all of this. All I knew is, so I, I said to him, I said, can I do that? So he says, yeah. So we left and we were going, going along and, and I took a handful of the sand and I was a little apprehensive because I was afraid he wasn't telling me everything. I thought it was going to suck my hand in. <laughs> the side, but it did. It just sucked the sand out, and then I made the smoke. So whenever we made four or one buys afterwards, I was always in charge of the sand. <laughs> this was the first night photograph that I had taken, and it was because of Glenn Anderson, who you saw in a, in a previous picture. He taught me how to take night pictures. And this picture was taken in Houston Union Station in March of 1970, the month before I was discharged. So little by little, I was learning more about photography and, of course, developing an interest in the trains and having Glenn and, and especially Harry around, that really made me quite more interested in railroading. But when I was uh, discharged in April 1970, I very reluctantly left Louisiana. Uh, I had been reluctant to go there a year and a half earlier, now I was very reluctant to leave. <clears throat> but I had a job waiting for me on Long Island, my family was on Long Island, and I figured, well, I guess I might as well go back to Long Island, and I'm sure I broke Harry's heart. Uh, and if I had it to do over again, I'm not quite so sure if I would do the same thing. What you're seeing here is my honorable uh, discharge medal. And this medal is a Vietnam era service medal. That's a medal that anybody that served in the military during the Vietnam era, they got that medal. You, and you also got a pin to put on your the blouse of your uniform. And this medal here is for people that served in country. And you can see, or I, I think you might be able to see, it says 1968-69, that's where I was there. I got there uh, a month before the Tet Offensive started in 1968. So those are the medals that I got from my military service, and of course, when I got back to Long Island, the first thing I did was I went out to the eastern end of Long Island and took this picture of a train at uh, the Montauk station. And now you can see I'm taking black and white pictures rather than color pictures. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, I had some grand scheme that I was going to become some big hot shot railroad photographer and blah, blah, blah. And back in those days, black and white pictures were all that were being printed in books. And the other thing was, was Glenn taught me how to develop black and white film and uh, to, to print pictures. I used to go into the photo lab at the base and we'd spend all the Air Force's money printing all the <laughs> pictures and everything else. So I started to take uh, black and white pictures. A month after my discharge, this special train uh, was running uh, on the Erie Railroad, and this was taken at uh, Hancock, New York, on the Erie, but this bridge uh, belonged to the abandoned O&W, so there was another O&W uh, connection. And by this time, I had my own dark room, and I was uh, developing my own film and uh, printing my own pictures. And that's me with, with my enlarger in that dark room. That was 1972. And the curious thing about that picture is that you probably wouldn't notice, but you see this shirt I'm wearing? <laughs> 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 
That's the shirt I'm wearing tonight. <laughs> 50 years old. I'll tell you, I don't wear it very frequently. It's only special occasions because it's getting kind of thin. But this is one hell of a shirt. <laughs> and I'm somebody that likes a good bargain. And I don't know how much I pay for this, but what I like about it is it's very well proportioned. It has the right length sleeves, it has cuffs that you can button, nice it fits, so it's comfortable and everything else. So one of these days I'm going to poke my, my uh, elbow through it or something or other and I'm going to hate that. But when I took this shirt out of the closet yesterday to make sure I had it ready for tonight, my wife said, you're not going to wear that, are you? <laughs> so I told her, I said, you're damn right I am. <laughs> when I used to work in Cunningbackville, we used to go, my father would take me up in the car in the, in the beginning of the summer, then I'd be there all summer long, and then he'd come at the end of the summer and pick, pick me up again. And we always traveled up to Tuxedo, New York. Uh, on old Route 17 to go up there because when he was younger, he and his motorcycle buddies used to ride up Route 17 and they'd get the tuxedo and if I heard him tell me the story once, I heard him tell me the story a hundred times and I wish I could have him tell me the story again because I'd love to hear it. He'd say, when we used to come up there on Route 17 and get the tuxedo, the cops always made sure we kept on going. <laughs> and I used to say, all right, Dad, I know the story, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But it would be nice to have him tell the story again. So, so tuxedo was one of the places that I went to to take pictures early on. And Port Jervis was another place because Working at Cuddybackville, every Saturday morning, Vinny and, and I and Margie, we go to Port Jervis so that she could go shopping at the A&P. And that was their trip to the city away. So because of those trips to Port Jervis, I knew that there was the Erie Railroad there, so I used to go there to take pictures. And I went there many times early on to take pictures of trains. And of all of those many times that I went, this was the only color picture that I took of a train coming up out of Port Jervis. This is Port Jervis in the background. And it's, the train has come along here, and it's climbing up uh, out of the Neversink River Valley. And that's the only color picture that I've ever took of it. Because I always wanted to be Oh, I fashioned myself as being a hotshot railroad photographer. I came up with the idea that I wanted to have my own magazine. So I started the lens. And this is issue number one in May 1972. It was the first issue. At its height, I had 594 subscribers. And I think it lasted seven years. It was a quarterly magazine, four dollars a year. You know, everything was cheap back in those days. Uh, and it lasted seven and a half years, I think, and the only reason that it met its demise was not because of the popularity. The magazine was as popular just as much as my popularity today with all of you folks, but it was because I was getting divorced for the first time, and my ex-wife's lawyer wanted to attach to the profits of the Lensman. Well, I wasn't making any money anyway. You know, I was having a lot of fun, but I wasn't making, and I said, they're not going to, that's, so I, I stopped. But nevertheless, I meet a lot of people today in the world of, of railroading that come up to me and say, are you the same John Taylor that used to do the lens years ago? And I said, yes, I am. And it's, it's nice to be remembered in that fashion. <clears throat> During the course of those early years, I, I took pictures, of course, in the East. This is uh, in uh, New York State. This is on the Delaware and Hudson excursion using uh, rare alcohol PAs uh, on the Susquehanna Valley 
special uh, at Harpersville and at Cobleskill. But I, I traveled all around the country to take pictures. This picture was taken in Cass, West Virginia, uh, and the, the Cass Scenic Railroad specialized in having geared steam locomotives, uh, Shays, Climaxes, and Heislers uh, running that line. And this was one of the pictures I took in West Virginia. And on the Baltimore and Ohio main line, I took this picture of a, of a big and old coal train crossing the confluence of the Shenandoah and the Potomac River. I got as far as Chicago uh, to, take, to take pictures. This picture was taken of a Santa Fe train. And then I made it out to Utah in 1980. I made four trips out to the western part of the United States to take train pictures and had a hell of a good time every time. It really was fantastic seeing the different country. And that's me uh, in 1980 at, at Soldier Summit. Soldier Summit is the top of a grade on the Rio Grande Railroad um, going into Salt Lake City. And this is a picture that was taken of its passenger train at the time. Uh, even though Amtrak had been formed four years earlier, the Rio Grande was still running its own trains because it did not join Amtrak. And this, uh, the Rio Grande Zephyr at the time, was a very popular photographer's train, and, and we took many pictures of it. When I got out into uh, New Mexico one time, my buddy Danny and I, who I always seem to be going out west with because he liked to drive and I liked to ride, uh, we came across this spot on the Santa Fe Railroad, a typical Santa Fe sign for small locations, Tavian. I said, holy smokes, it, it, we, I, we came to a screeching stop. The highway was only right over here. The tracks were right next to it. I saw that, so naturally I stopped to take a picture of it. And I, I thought to myself, well, that's probably the closest that I'm ever going to come to having a railroad location named to me. And with a little imagination, you can see that <laughs> we could very easily have changed it if you wanted. The name of the Santa Fe Railroad would not have even noticed it. And right around the corner from Tabi, New Mexico, was where uh, an Amtrak train uh, going to uh, California was climbing uh, Raton Pass. So uh, I was getting around the country <coughs> excuse me, quite well taking pictures. This one was taken in California, as was this train right here. And the, the thing that I have always liked about this particular picture is as time went on, I developed to have, uh, a specialty of, of uh, getting along with the railroad people. I, I, I liked to so socialize with them, meet them. If there were railroad people working at these times, there were still section men and station agents and tower men and everything else. And I always liked talking with them and and getting to see the insides of all these buildings that they, that they worked in. And on this particular day, uh, this train, this was the, uh, the Mojave Flyer. And the reason they called it the Mojave Flyer was because it went from Mojave to Bakersfield, excuse me, Mojave to, uh, uh, to Barstow, and it was like a cleanup train. It scooted around, getting all the cars in all the different places. But on this piece of railroading on Tehachapi Loop, which was basically a single track railroad, they had sidings in, in different places. And you can see there's a train here in the siding. And if you look closely, there's another train back here also on the siding. And when this train went by us, we had a scanner, just like your scanner that you were telling me about. The, uh, the Mojave Flyer is going along, and the engineer says to the dispatcher, he says, thanks for the break, Russ. In other words, the dispatcher knew that this engineer was going to get his train 
over the road and get out of the way of these other two trains without delaying them. So he got, he let this engineer take the train. And I always liked the fact that the dispatcher recognized the ability of the engineer to do that. And I think it's a good quality in people, no matter what uh, profession we have, is to recognize how people are able to efficiently do what they're supposed to do. And in this particular case, the engineer was thanking the dispatcher for acknowledging that. I made a couple of trips up into Canada, too. This picture was taken inside the shop. And this, was a, this particular picture was taken because of some of the tutelage that uh, Glenn had also uh, taught me when we were stationed in Louisiana. So by 1955, 1985, uh, I was more or less a certified railroad photo bum, living my happy life in and out of marriage, you know, with, uh, like that picture you saw earlier, a time for love. Well, it just always seemed like whenever there was railroading involved, I never had much time for love. Uh, so in 1985, I was a happy as a pig in the, uh, pig in the poke. Uh, but I also developed another interest was long distance bicycling. And oh my god, I love to do that. I, I lived on Long Island where it was flat. Uh, after work, I'd ride 30, 40, 50 miles a day. I, it was a hell of a lot of fun. Plus, it was free. Once you bought the bike, it didn't push anything to do that. Well, what happened one particular day is a car snuck up behind me and ran over me. And uh, that happened in 1987. Uh, my shoulder got broken. Uh, you can see I got a gash on my head there and everything else and all. He laid me pretty low for about 18 months. But what happened was, is that after uh, I recovered, I had a, a little bit of a financial windfall because of the settlement for the accident. Mm -hmm. And it was really the first time in my life I had more than a couple of nickels to rub together. And, uh, but I, I also thought, well, just because I have the money doesn't mean I have to spend it. But at that time, the Monsville Station became a bill of sale. And at the time, the, the woman who was selling it, she wanted $60,000 for it. <laughs> and I told her, I said, you know, that's way too much money. So she says, well, how, how much money would you pay for it? So I says, well, I'll be honest with you. I says, I don't even know if I want it or not. But I guess if I did, I, I'd give you $10,000. So she said, well, if you want to give me $10,000, I would take it. So I told her, well, I'm going to have to decide if that's what I wanted to do. Because here I was, free as a bird, just getting over my uh, near-fatal accident, uh, just getting back to work. Did I want to buy a beat-up old railroad station and commit myself to going from Long Island back and forth to Munster all the time rather than traveling willy-nilly around the country? I wasn't sure I, I wanted to do that, but I did in 1989. And the purchase of the Munsville Station, essentially it changed my life. Uh, and I like to tell people that uh, the, reason, the main reason that it changed my life was because eventually I moved up here after living on Long Island for 45 years. And on Long Island, I was a nobody, but up here I've become a somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so I have the Lonesville Station to thank for that. How old was that station now? Excuse me? How old was that station? It was built in 1881. Wow. Yeah. So in 1994, I had completely restored the station. And of course, you have to remember at 19. 94, I was in my 40s. I was in good physical shape because I was bicycling. I could drive back and forth every weekend, withstanding the rigors of five and a half hours of driving each way, standing on a ladder 10 hours a day to do the restoration. 
I could do it again today, it would take me a lot longer because <laughs> I, I still would have the desire to do it. But then I, I did it very efficiently. And the, the more I did, the more I was happy I plunked down that $10,000. <clears> if you go uh, to the station today, this is the interior in We've taken some liberties with the interior because, frankly, we live there now and we use it for a variety of things. But you can see that there's a lot of different things. There's a lot of historical things in there. It's somewhat like a museum where originally I had it outfitted as a country station, which it still is, but it's just now it's a home beside. And from the outside, this is the way the station looks today. And the reason that I put these awnings on was because we used to have a big shade tree in front of the place that's not there anymore. And that shade tree, without the shade from it in the summertime, oh boy, would it get hot in there. <coughs> and I, I have yet to convince my wife that, that uh, even though these walls of the waiting room and the agent's office don't have any insulation, when they get hot, you can't get them cool hot. The air conditioners just can't do anything. In the wintertime, when they get cold, you can't warm them up. <laughs> Folks in the old days must have been hardy. We're, younger, we're youngsters. As you know, I'm going to be 75. We've lived a life of comfort. We're softies compared to the people that used to have to work in buildings like this. And of course, during those 30 years that I've, I've lived up here, I've come to write a few books. And I'm sure that some of you have been to a few book signings here. And uh, over time, Liz has had me here for uh, presentations on a, a variety of occasions. These two books here were written on Long Island. This was the first book that I wrote when I was up here. It was a story about railroading in the Stockbridge Valley, which is where the Munsville Station was. And I remember when that book was first published by the Ontario and Western Railway Historical Society, <clears throat> uh, I, I bought 100 copies from them to sell in the Stockbridge Valley area. And you might be interested to know that, yes, authors have to buy books. <laughs> we get them for a reduced rate, but we still have to buy them. Uh, so I had these 100 books when I was driving from Middletown back to Munsville. And I thought to myself, how in the hell am I ever going to sell 100 of these books? So I, when I got back to the station, I made a few phone calls to friends that I, I knew in the area. And within 45 minutes, I sold 90 copies. <laughs> I was absolutely flabbergasted. And the bad part was that uh, the next two days was a Saturday and a Sunday. I, was, I had a book signing to go on there, and I only had 10 books left. And I, I believe it was a Sunday morning, I had 75 people in the station. You know, so I thought to myself, you know, there might be something to this railroad authorship going on. So I wrote a few other books when the railroads went to the beach. And a few, all these were O and W books. Then I wrote a couple of uh, Delaware and Hudson books and Electrified Third Rail. This is the most recent book. This is the book that I'll be talking about on May 19th, you know, right. when, when you come back to that. But I, I want to refresh your memory of Janice, uh, the girl in the picture that had her arm wrapped around my arm in 1959. I should have told you at the time her name was Janice Stassa. Uh, and and I, I knew her from 1955. I still know her from 1955. Her birthday is April 7th. And and we talk on the phone all the time, and I expect on June 9th, next month, I'll get a call from Janice again. But what happened was, is in the early part of the 20th century, there was a fellow by the name of Alan Chapman. Excuse me while I take a drink. 
And he wrote books that were titled Ralph and the Roundhouse, Ralph the Station Agent, Ralph the Locomotive Engineer, Ralph the Ticket Taker. Uh, all these, it was the Ralph series of books, and I think there was 11 of them all together. So when we were living in, in the station, we've always had dogs, and one of our dogs was named Ralph. Well, we named him after Ralph Ramley because he was the king of the house. <laughs> so I got the idea that wouldn't it be cute to have our Ralph on the railroad. But I was not an illustrator. I, I came from a much more than a stick man. But when I went to my 50th high school reunion a few years back, I met Janice again, who I hadn't seen for, for many years. And we got to talking and, and renewing our uh, acquaintance and everything else. And I, I told her about my railroad writing and how, oh, you know, I have this idea that, she says, well, well I can, I can draw. She said, I, I can, I'm a little bit of an illustrator. So I, I said, well, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we collaborated on this book about my Ralph's antics on the railroad? So we did. And this was the book that was produced. And I haven't been able to find uh, a children's book publisher that would publish it because they want to be able to use their illustrators to illustrate the book. Not that there's anything wrong with Janice's illustrations. As a matter of fact, they're the Cat's Meow. And I told him, I said, no, no, that's it. So it's, I have, I produced it digitally on a digital PDF, but of all of these books up there, this one is of uh, really uh, uh, my main interest because of that go back to Janice in 1959 when she had her arm wrapped around me and everything else. And I think that it's just the nicest thing after all of these years. And, and you know, when I had my 50th high school reunion, by that time my mother and father had died. Uh, the only people alive that knew me from 1955 was my brother. My sister hadn't been born yet, and all of these kids in that third grade picture, most of whom were at the 50th high school reunion. And I, I told them when I did a presentation uh, about this book. Uh, this was a book I wrote about growing up on Long Island. And I, I tell everybody, you should all write books of your life experiences whether you think there's anything significant in there or not is immaterial because somebody else probably will. So I did a presentation at the Brentwood Library and uh, all of these uh, 50th uh, anniversary <coughs> guys and girls were there and I told them, I says, you know, of all of the people that I know, I know you longer than anybody else. Yeah, we don't see each other all that often, but when we do, we have a hell of a good time. <laughs> and, and isn't that the sign of, of friends, is that while you're away from each other all the time, when you get together, you have a hell of a good time. And that's why that book, Ralph, and, and my thoughts of Janice, and her father always wanted me to marry Janice. I worked with her father in the post office. Her father and my father and I, we all worked together, and he wanted me to marry her. But, you know, love wasn't in the cards for me at the particular time. But besides doing my writing, I, I do a lot of research. And in this picture, I'm at the uh, Adirondack Museum researching Henry Beach. Uh, negatives, and here I am at the National Archives in uh, College Park, Maryland, which is the gold mine for railroad research. They have stuff there that it's absolutely incredible. And my two latest books, Hope Jack and the previous one, Silver Rails, which was a story about them on that railroading, the reason that they're almost 800 pages each 
Number one, I write like I talk, you just don't <laughs> <laughs> And number two, it's because of the National Archives. They have so much good stuff that you can't keep anything out. And then, of course, I do a lot of lecturing, too. Uh, I would have to say the four corners of New York State, I've got it pretty well covered. And I was saying to my friend John here earlier today, I, I wished when I started doing all of these lectures, I had kept track of, of all of them. Because I don't think it's, it would reach a thousand, but it, it's certainly in the high hundreds of all of the lecturing that I do it. And I hope you can tell that, that I do like doing that. And I do it not so much to tell you what I know is I like to hear most times of what people in the audience knows. And that was why for this presentation, I wanted to do it as the third person and talk about John Tabey as not being John Tabey, but God damn it, it didn't work. <laughs> I was also the curator for the Franklin Railroad and Community Museum, which had been endowed by New York Susquehanna and Western President Walter Rich just shortly before he died. Uh, that was one of the highlights of my career. And then I was also, uh, I also became a member of the Board of Directors of the Adirondack uh, Railway Preservation Society and its Adirondack Scenic Railroad. And I was its Vice President. And one of the things that I particularly like about those positions, although I am not connected any longer, is that I got to know many railroaders. And these guys are fantastic guys. And if you ever want to have fun, railroad guys are good guys to have fun with. And some of the best times I've had uh, were in the locomotive camp. We would just always have a good time. And it's because of that association that I've developed with railroaders throughout my career of taking pictures and appreciating what they do and, and everything that everybody, for some reason or other, despite all of my shortcomings, uh, of which my wife tells me I have many, <laughs> uh, we get along and I. I, I think very highly of them. So what's next for this notable author that's standing before you? Well, I'm, I'm going to detour from railroading from one work. As I, I'm, I'm working with a fellow who is the great-grandson of the driver of the car that won the New York to Paris race in 1908. And I don't know how I got roped into doing this. <laughs> Because much has been written, the, the great-grandson who I'm working with, he owns the story. It's, it's, it's everything from his great-granddad, and it, you know, but somehow we got connected, and I think the thing is, is he, he recognized that I like to tell a good story. And in all of my books, my books are a dry history, my books are telling you a story. Uh, and I think that is the thing that, that people uh, like about my work. And apparently this fellow, Jeff, does too, because he's, he told me just today in a Zoom conference that he thought this book would be the definitive book of his great-grandfather's activities of his life for that great race. And, and that pleases me. So this is going to be a good story. Uh, and it reminds me that... The creator of the, the TV show 60 Minutes, I can't think of his name offhand. Uh, Don Hewitt. Don Hewitt, thank you very much. Who told, who, who said that? Thank you, Peter. Uh, when he was interviewed shortly before he died, uh, the, the 60 Minutes uh, person asked him, to what do you attribute the success of 60 Minutes? And he says, oh, that's easy. He says, I can answer that question in, in four words. Tell people a story. And, and I hope that 
tonight, despite it didn't come out the way I did. I hope you enjoyed me telling you this story too. And when you have an opportunity to read any of my books, and Liz's library has them all, if they don't have them handy, they can get them through interlibrary loan. It doesn't cost you anything to do it except you'll have the enjoyment of reading it. When you, when you do that, that would really please me that, that I'm able to tell you that story in the books that I've written. I was going to tell you in the beginning of the program that John Tavy doesn't like blowing his own horn. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't. And I, I'm perspiring a little bit throughout this whole presentation because I ended up having to do that. Nevertheless, thank you very much for putting up with the story. <laughs> wonderful story in a library that's filled with many wonderful stories. So thank you all very much for coming.